Hey, Eagles fans, this is Chris Franklin from NJ Advanced Media. I know it's been a while, but officially, welcome back to the No Huddle Show podcast, where we're going to discuss all things related to the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, before we begin, I just want to remind you all that you can still read our content on NJ.com slash Eagles, and make sure to bookmark that to get the latest Eagles news and analysis, because we all know there's a lot of stuff going on with this team. Now, today... We're going to be back here talking with the No Huddle Show. We're going to be talking about that Cowboys game, which was been a crazy nail biter, something that I'm pretty sure that some of you guys might want to see a cardiologist after what happened. That was another close, close thing. We'll also talk about the injury to Dallas Goddard and how that could impact the offense and this back seven coverage, what's going on with there, and finally what to expect with the bye week. Now, before we get into the show, you know, we have someone new joining the No Huddle Show. He's currently here with us right now. He's the co-host for this episode and for the foreseeable future. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Caden Steele. Caden, how are you doing today? Doing great. i um, excited, you know, to join the show, Chris, and, you know, talk some football and everything that's going on with the 8-1 Eagles right now. But it going well last night, like you said, you know, for those Eagles fans out there, you know, you might need to like check your pulse a little bit. It was a crazy game, and I'm excited to get into it. Hey, that's cool, man. That's cool. So I know it was like you, you're, you're a new guy. Everybody has to go through this. It's the, it's the, it's the hey, everybody, this is Caden Steele. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I grew up in Lewis, Delaware, my whole entire life down in like Sussex County, Delaware. Chris, you're another Delaware guy, but you know, on two different sides of you know of the state. You you're on the north, I'm down in the south near the beach. Uh, family uh, growing up, own two restaurants, uh, still do. So huge into uh, food and uh, that part of the industry. My uncle owns a restaurant, so that's just more about the background of my like my family. I grew up with. Uh, two sisters and one brother. So I'm, you know, a big family. Uh, and then overall, you know, after, you know, spending a lot of time down in Lewis, I played sports, you know, growing up, uh, always wanted to be, you know, a college or a pro athlete, but tore both my ACLs in high school. And I realized it wasn't meant for me, but from the sidelines or, you know, in a press box or, you know, wherever I was, uh, I realized eventually that, you know, I could write and not get hurt. So I ended up going down this path, uh, went to Temple University, uh, I spent four years there, just graduated back in May, uh, and I was an intern at the Philadelphia Inquirer, covered Temple Athletics, worked at Alice Group, covered recruiting and all different things, but was really, you know, hugely involved at Temple, and now now I'm here, so I'm excited to be here. You know, with that injury history, man, you'd probably be a good source with everything's going on, this, the way those injury lists are bouncing out, and <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it, they should get some reinforcements, but, but more of that later on. Uh, as we as we mentioned, it's good, glad to have you on board, man, and uh, looking forward to uh, covering the rest of the season, which could be one that goes beyond the regular season, which should be one that goes beyond the regular season, but let's get into it. Let's get into uh, Sunday's uh, win. As we mentioned before, very close affair. Eagles found themselves actually down at halftime, 17-14, and it looked like it was one of those games where it, it was a complete roller coaster, one of them where you're looking like, okay, the offense had its moments, the defense had its moments, and you look and you think like, okay, this team looks like a team that could be the Super Bowl, but then you look back, turn around quickly, and it's, well, are we looking at divisional divisional round exit? But this is what they've done – Throughout this whole entire year, they found a way to win. I just want to get your initial thoughts of what you saw from uh, yesterday's game. Yeah, and I think yesterday's game was a really, you know, in this, in a sense, I think you could take away that this team continues to find ways to win and they're resilient. The fact that, you know, Dallas had two possessions at the end of the game where they could have scored and the defense came up strong with, you know, Brandon Brandon Graham getting a huge sack and Josh Sweat and uh, a split sack between Jalen Carter and Brandon Graham. I think in that sense, it's a positive because, you know, this team just finds ways to make plays. And I think in a sense, that is what this team's identity is. But we also saw some of the weaknesses that this team didn't decide to fix at the deadline. There were, you know, ideas that maybe they would add a, another cornerback or someone else to the secondary. And I think and last night, uh, various times, C.D. Lamb and Jake Ferguson, the tight end for the Cowboys, and a few other players got open. And I think going forward, that is a concern. So I, a win is nice. You go 8-1 going into the bye week. But overall, at the end of the game, the defense – 
should have never been in that position. The offense could have closed it out. And then there was points where the defense gave up too many big plays, especially early on in the first half, uh, where I think, you know, there's some concerns going forward. Yeah, you mentioned uh, when you look at CeeDee Lamb, you know, see, when you look at his numbers, it was just crazy. You know, 11 catches for 191 yards and 29-yard touchdown. I guess, you know, uh, when you look at the way he's impacted, it, it's been two weeks now that we've seen teams have success in the middle of the field at second level, especially within 10 yards with the Eagles trying to defend that the Eagles having issues defending them and letting quarterbacks get into a rhythm. That's the thing I continue to question and wonder about how they fix. Because when you look at a lot of these teams that are upcoming, you look at what's happened right now so far, they've been attacking them. They've been allowing them to, to, to eat them in the field. It's kept this defense out on the field for such a long time. You start to worry that they're going to continue to be on there, on there and it's going to wear them down over time. And it's a little rough. I mean, giving up 406 total yards to that Cowboys offense. The Cowboys are no slouch offensively. You know, they, they got weapons, Tony Pollard, Dak Prescott, say what you will about them, even though it, it looked like he came up short again. But you look when he was moving between the 20s, he was moving that ball efficiently and making big plays. So, I mean, if, if, if I'm going to give you the uh, Sean Desai's job for a moment here. How do you fix this back seven coverage and and limit what they, what these offices are able to do going forward. I, it's tough because you know in the back seven right now with with your nickel corners especially, and this is nothing against Cindy Brown and Eli Ricks because they both have bright futures and throughout the games that they've played in, we've seen a lot of bright movements, uh, especially from you know. Eli Ricks in that Dolphins game when he, he was guarding Tyreek Hill. It was a lot of positives to take away from that. And then last week, you know, in Sidney Brown's first uh, – or his, his, his first, you know, shot at that nickel spot, and he made a lot of plays. You could see why they drafted him in the third round, getting in the backfield, stopping a reverse home play, just, you know, coming through the line of scrimmage. He was super aggressive. So there's a lot of positives to take away. But you have two rookies back there, and, you know, last night – a couple times they were going against C.D. Lamb, and he, he took advantage of them. And there's going to be other wide receivers that are going to be in that position and are also going to take advantage of them because it's tough to play in this league at corner, you know, when you're a rookie. And then in the same sense, I guess, you know, your biggest hope if you're Desai is, I know we haven't seen him, you know, much because he's been hurt, but you had to hope Riley Roby, you know, comes back and is able to play nickel corner. I know he's up there in age and who knows, you know, what he has left, but maybe he can be the band aid that you need while, you know, Brown and Rex continue to develop. And then at the same time, I just, you just need better overall play from, you know, the back end. And with Reed Blankenship and Kyvin Byard, I think, you know, or at least last night, there were times where they got beat by tight ends. And they're a good group. Um, you know, obviously, Byard's been an all pro and uh, Reed. You know, earned a starting job as an undrafted free agent, you know, from the previous year. But there's just, you know, you made no additions at the trade down line. So I guess from that perspective, you're kind of just stuck with the guys you have. And I think this team is really reliant on the pass rush. If that, you know, doesn't come with Reddick and Graham and Cox and Sweat and everyone, I the secondary, I think, is going to continue to have troubles, you know, all year. Desai this year has been really good at adjusting and he's been creative. He's definitely going to have to find a solution. But right now, this is the biggest weakness of this team. And you mentioned last night at times, it looked like this is a team that could make the Super Bowl or this is a team that could get upset in the playoffs. I mean, the biggest reason why is because of that secondary. And Desai has been great this year, but he's going to have to find a solution because against the Commanders, they really struggled, and some people were, were like, ah, maybe it's just a Sam Howell thing because he has success in week four, week, also against them, and then week seven he had success uh, week, I mean, week eight. But he's got to find a solution, and the last two weeks are you know, pretty concerning. You know, I like in, uh, when I look at Sidney Brown and Eli Rick, especially in that middle, uh, in the middle of the field defensively, I, look, I think of it like a jo- they went to a, a job listing site, and they're like, oh, I like this job. I'm going to be outside corner. Oh, I'll be safety. Oh, this looks good. The details are good. Then they go 
in and they see anything like, yeah, we want you to play completely different. And now they're like, uh, okay. And trying to get adjusted to that. I mean, it, I, I, I look at the way you see the instincts that Sidney Brown has shown trying to break on the ball when he was in college at Illinois. And you saw some of that earlier on this year, like in, during the preseason and, it looks you can still see like he's got those aspects still there. He's like he's still trying to he's still trying to put things together. I think you saw that, especially in, in the fourth quarter when uh, Lamb on, on that final drive when Lamb was able to get down to I believe it was like the six the six something like that. Yeah, where he he got caught up in, in the wash in there. And, and same with Eli Ricks, you saw a couple of times where it was just a couple of sudden moves and, and then got physical. Like you go back to. Your, your natural state you got physical, and the next thing you know, out it goes. I mean, they still the Bradley Roby can't come here soon enough, and I think it, I think for anybody observing this team or follows this team, you know that uh, he is going to be coming back. I mean, last night uh, on Twitter, somebody asked him he's coming back after bye. He said yes, sir. So you know, you got that that aspect of, of the secondary returning. I also look at the fact that if Zach Cunningham wasn't here, where would this team be coverage wise? I mean, you you look at the way he's playing. He's looking like the old Zach Cunningham back from his days with the Houston Texans, going out in coverage and and and, and playing and playing space and being an adept tackler in that middle part, which helps. But if they didn't have him, they they're up a creek without a paddle. And I'm starting to wonder, like, and, you know, you, so you heard names like Kenny Moore being mentioned at the trade deadline, and you look at it, and, it, and I understand why the Eagles didn't do it. They they didn't have a lot of spaces to fill positions to fill at the trade uh, next year's draft with some guys potentially retiring and free agents going and so forth and so on. But a guy like Kenny Moore right now would have shored up that secondary to a point where it almost would have made you forget that, hey, no, Avante Maddox was, was there. And that was the thing that really messed this whole thing up. Yeah, you got to figure they're going to be in the in the lab. I hope Sean decide almost like Jay Z. He's in the lab right now, trying to come <laughs> up with some stuff that he's going to drop some new stuff. But you know, let's look at the other side of the ball. You you, you look at uh, Jalen Hurts, and he's still dealing with that knee and that bone bruise that he has in his knee, and it's changed the. Uh, it, it looks like it's just completely changed the flow of that offense. What they do best. How I just want to get what's your takeaways for the way that. Hertz has been playing with that knee, and do you feel like this is a success? Uh, this is a recipe that the Eagles should adapt with, keeping him in the pocket later on. Do you think he should go back out and continue to start running the ball again? Yeah, it's interesting because one of his you know strongest skills throughout the beginning of his career, especially those first two years, and even you know last year uh, when he had an All Pro season, is that he's able to use his legs and create plays and out of structure, and that. That's what made him an MVP candidate. So I don't think you want to take that away once or if he gets healthy at some point this year. It would be great, you know, to get that back in the offense. But I think Jalen continues to show he is developing as a pocket passer. And the narrative at the beginning of his career and when he was at Alabama and even when he improved at Oklahoma was that he was never going to possibly develop into this guy that could sit in the pocket and deliver, um, you know, accurate throws on a consistent basis. And because of the injury in a way, even though he did do it last year, he he's proved that without his legs, he's still a really efficient quarterback. 17 of 23 last night, uh, two touchdowns, 207 yards. He, he just looks poised and confident and, He's doing all of this while banged up. Going forward, uh, you know, I think he's still going to make some plays with his legs, but he is a truly efficient quarterback from the pocket. And it helps when, you know, your offensive line is one of the best in the league. I know last night, you know, they gave up some plays, uh, some sacks, including the one on, with Mark, Micah Parsons, and then Lawrence came underneath and hit his knee, which caused him, you know, the hobble off the field there. And it caused a little panic with the Eagles fans. But for the most part, it's a really good unit. He's comfortable. He's accurate. He's making throws that, you know, over this, you know, last two weeks that have continued to press me, the one that Devontae Smith, he just puts it where no one else can get it. There's a trust between him and AJ and him and Devontae. This offense, you know, you want balance and you want to be able to run the ball and you want you want those RPOs, you want him to use his legs, but they can win in a multitude of ways, including letting Jalen just sit back. And it's been super impressive to watch. You know, I, I'm torn. 
I really am because I look at his running ability and, and taking taking brotherly shove, tush push, whatever trademark thing is coming about. We don't know yet, but uh, well, we do know the trademark, but we don't know which one they're going to use or prefer. But I look at it and, and, and I see the way he's developed as a passer in the pocket. And he he improved on that last year, and I see him the way he's doing it this year. It's almost like I don't want to take that element completely away from him because maybe it's because I'm from the time when I looked at Donovan McNabb and people started labeling him a, a running quarterback. And I got, and then after that he stopped running. He just wanted to be in the pocket the whole time. I hope Jalen doesn't go down that route. Maybe I'm still burnt by what McNabb did back then watching that and seeing what happened with there. But I look at this fact that I, and they still are running some of these RPRs defenses are now, they, they know he's not, as healthy as he used to be. So they're moving more guys into the box and they're stopping that run game. I mean, the, the run game wasn't as efficient as it's been in the past. It, you look at the rushing totals. I got it right here. Excuse me. So I was get this here. Yeah. They finished with a, a net of, they, fin- they finished with 109 rushing yards and averaging 3.3 yards per carry. That's not the Eagles rushing offense that we, we, we've come to know over his past. That'd be this season into the last one. And a large, I put a large part of that on the ability of Hertz not being able to run on the outside and a, taking a defender or two away from him on that. And I look for downturn in the future. I want to keep him healthy as if I'm the Eagles. I want to keep him as healthy as possible because you know that they're going teams are going to start gunning for that leg again, and you know that you have bigger aspirations than just putting the Cowboys, but long term when it comes to the playoffs. So I'm not so sure. If you continue to do that, now, I'm, and this question just popped up in my mind. Is curious this: If you were to play, if you're Brian Johnson, would he have th- in the fourth quarter? Would you have thrown for it on third and three? I think uh, it's tough. If I were Brian Johnson, I believe I would because I trust Jalen Hurts um, the most of any player on this team. There's a reason. You gave him $255 million in a five-year contract extension is to make those plays in big moments and make big throws. And in that position, I would have rolled, you know, rolled with a throw. Really? You really want, you really want to go? You, you really stuck to the guns and, and risk that? Because we've seen what happened in the past when they tried to throw the ball we've, in these big spots when, when Hurts did it. I still, the Jets game still rings long in my mind. You still want to throw there and not try to run the ball, run the ball again and, and try to milk some clock off there? I, I guess my mindset is, you know, to always be aggressive. I see your point where, you know, it is a risk and that hasn't always worked. And you do get to, you know, get to milk more clock and, you're more risky if you throw there, but I feel like you just got to trust Jalen in those situations. Okay. All right. Uh, would you do that? All right. Take it away from the Cowboys. Say you're playing the 49ers. You're still doing that again. And th- say like it's third and three you're st- and it's late in the game. You're still going to let Jalen throw the ball against the 49ers. And the Eagles are up, you know, in this position, S- same situation, same, same situation. Situ- <sighs> Ah, it's, it's tough. Uh, but I mean, I guess, you know, I kind of reevaluating, you know, my opinion here is because if you have third and three and we've seen them, they even did it, you know, in the first quarter, they went for the brotherly shove or touch push, whatever you want to call it. If you run the ball, you know, on 33, you milk clock, you could probably get the fourth of one, at least if you get the ball away to DeAndre Swift or whoever is back there. And then you can convert first and fourth and one, you know. Like they always do on the tush push, and then you end the game. So I, I see both sides of it. Um, I think part of it is naturally. I think Nick Sirianni's staff, uh, you know, he they pride themselves on being aggressive, and but it, it could, you know, come back to bite them in a situation like that. And you give the ball back, you know, to San Francisco, you know, in this hypothetical situation with Brock Purdy and. With that team more healthy and coming up in the next few weeks, and they end up driving down and scoring, and then you look at it and you could have played it safe. But we've seen time in time out this year in critical situations where, uh, even in that Commanders game uh, when they went for the long touchdown, AJ Brown at the end of the game, they didn't have to do that. They could have chewed more clock, ran the ball, been more methodical, got down the red zone, and ended that game. But Sirianni went for a big play. So I think that's just part of their DNA. So I think that is what they'll continue to do. 
But if, you know, if I were an Eagles fan and I saw, you know, them go for it on third and three and pass it, I would be, you know, a little fearful that worst case scenario could happen. But as the season goes on, I don't think they're going to go away from, you know, what they do. But running the ball with Swift and the guys that they have back there is a more methodical, conservative, probably safer you know, choice. But we'll see if they continue to you know stay aggressive or you know, maybe play it more smart or conservative, whatever you want to describe it as at the end of the game. Well, now uh, one thing, one target that Jalen Hurts won't have when he's trying to throw in such a situation like that is tight end Dallas Goddard. Goddard was injured earlier in the game uh, when he broke his. He actually has a fracture forearm, according to ESPN's Adam Schefter, and the timetable is looking like he's going to be out at least four to six weeks, which basically makes him look like he's going to have a stint on injured reserve. When you look at this offense and the way it, it goes through, we've heard continuously times that. Nick Sir, and we were from Nick Sirianni saying the offense throws through three people, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and Dallas Goddard. Now you lose that, you lose Goddard. Who would you trust to become that third guy in that offense, and how do you think Goddard's loss is going to impact this impact this team? It's going to severely impact this team, potentially. We all saw last year when he suffered the injury uh, against the Commanders when Jamin Davis you know, pulled him down illegally. The, the for reminder when they lost Goddard for it just didn't look as you know efficient you know in the games that he missed last year and the offense got better when he returned he is one of the best tight ends in the league I know this year maybe at times they haven't gotten him involved more for the fact that they just have so many different mouths to feed less to do with the fact that you know that he's regressed or anything like that. He's still up there. He might not be Travis Kelsey or George Kittle, but he's right up there with that next tier with Mark Andrews and guys like that. He is a big, you know, you know, player in this offense. And when teams take away AJ and Devontae going forward, now you don't have that third option. It might make it easier for teams coming up like the Chiefs, like the Bills, like the Niners to focus more on Devontae, focus more on AJ because they know the Eagles don't have that third threat anymore. A guy across the middle can, that can make it easier, you know, for the guys on the inside. Goddard, you know, that's the, the one thing in his career and, I, and it's starting to, and I know some of it is bad luck, but he, his potential I think is out of this roof. He could be a Pro Bowl, All Pro, you know, level tight end, but the injuries have, you know, really caused him not to reach his full potential last year, like I mentioned. And now this year, and he's been banged up throughout his career and he just can't seem to stay fully healthy. It looks like he's possibly heading to injury reserve with that surgery. So now you're gonna miss him for a long period of time. Not only can is his own development hindered, but it hinders the offense. And so now you got to find a third option. And I just don't know if there's a great solution necessarily. You hope Quez, you know, gets removed from IR. And when he comes back, he plays, you know, better than he did because the last, ever since, you know, the end of, you know, 2022, the Quez Watkins, I think people were, you know, excited about after um, 2021 and the beginning part of 2022. He, he wasn't very consistent and he and never really took that next step to develop into a true number three wide receiver. You bring Julio Jones in and he obviously catches that touchdown against the commanders. And for what he is at this point in his career, he's no longer the Julio of old, but in a pinch, he might be able to make more plays like that the rest of the season. I don't know if that's enough to be a consistent third option. And I'm not sure exactly how he fits. I guess the third guy you know, Nick Sirianni talks him up. Uh, it would be Alameda Zacchaeus, a guy who still, you know, gets a decent amount of snaps. He would be my third option, but it's not something I feel great about. Uh, play had a lot of experience in Atlanta, was a pretty productive pl- uh, player for being an undrafted free agent. But either way, they're going to really miss Goddard. And from the tight end position, I, uh, Jack Stoll, you know, filled his snaps last year, and Grant Calcaterra, who was in concussion protocol this week, we'll see how he comes back from that. But neither guy, you know, is going to be able to replicate, you know, what Goddard did. Stoll's a really good blocker. He's a manageable receiver; like he can make a catch or two, but he's not going to threaten a defense. Calcaterra, uh, known for being a guy who can 
in college at least was a very good wide receiver hasn't really proved it at this level and it, it just from that perspective it's going to be really 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 tough and you mentioned you know this offense going forward and if they're not able to run the ball and, and if if and you lose a weapon like this you figure it's going to t- take some hit there this offense might be less efficient you know going forward they're gonna have to find a solution and in all likelihood it's just you know more targets for Devontae Smith and AJ Brown and there's a missing element but those guys could produce even greater numbers which is crazy to say after AJ Brown broke an NFL record just last week and but maybe Devontae you know becomes a bigger part of the offense even more than he currently is just because you don't have Goddard. But that third option, in a way, is unappealing no matter you know who you throw out there. See, when I look at it now, I, I, at first I'm thinking Albert Okuyambuyanubunam. I apologize, Albert. You get really, he's a good guy. Sorry to say that five times fast. But Albert O, I look at him as a potential option. But the guy I'm really looking at as the potential third option is now Julio Jones. I look at the way that he runs those interior routes in the slot, and it is reminiscent of a lot of the stuff that Goddard has done and Goddard has done in replicating this offense. You, you, you want somebody, especially with with Quez Watkins that has been out. You want somebody that can occupy that safety, occupy that linebacker, to at least take some of that, uh, to, to, to at least occupy to open up space for behind it. Because this team loves to run those double slants with with. with, with with Smith and Brown, and they also they love it also helps you run in a run game too. If you can put pressures on safety and then to stay back a little bit, it opens things up. So I probably go with Julio for myself. I probably go with Julio Jones to give him some extra run and, and to be that third guy. A dark horse that I'd probably be looking at as well too. Maybe you see more screen passes to DeAndre Swift because especially with I, I thought it was a little wrink, a nice little wrinkle that they included last week we, they, we heard about last year when they used a the speed package when they had Boston Scott and Kenneth Gainwell or Miles Sanders and Kenneth Gainwell in, a, in the backfield at the same time as well too their speed package it, it they, they cross one person across one side of the, the line and then you'd see the other go out in the flat and it, it opened up a lot of stuff because you have to respect the run in that way you're running RPOs off of that and I look at the receiving ability of Swift and the potential big playability when he gets out in space, I think he can be your good third option. You just you have to lean on him a little more. The concerning part for me is he has to continue to hold on to the ball because after seeing him fumble a couple of times yesterday, it, it, it's a little stomach churning a little bit to be honest. But you look you look at the the potential you have in this one. You, you know he's going to want to get you, – you're worried about the injury element with him. You're worried about how you, you don't want him to take too many shots. But he's going to want the ball a little bit more. He's in a contract here. You know he's going to be extra motivated. Why not see what you can get on one of the edges and try to get him out there at least for the next four to six weeks, seeing if you can do that. I mean, Grant Calcaterra, you know, he, he well, we saw him – I saw him working out a little bit when he came to the uh, concussion protocol late last week. And still wasn't able to go. He has a hit that history with concussions as well, too, and it forced him to step away from the game in college. So he, you hope he returns back, and you hope he returns back to the level of play that the team envisioned him being. But even then, when he had, I think he had five catches for like 81 yards last year, he wasn't that big of a factor. And when you look at Jack Stoll, it hurts. It took a little bit for Hurts to get to trust him, and when he finally trust him, he gave it his way. But it was not, not a near an earth shattering amount of targets. So I'm looking at Julio Jones and potentially DeAndre Swift to be the options. So we're heading into the uh, bye week now. Some rest time for the Eagles. Some rest time for some reporters as well too when it comes to there. But when they come back. It, it's not an easy stretch whatsoever. The Eagles have one of the toughest stretches of games of any of the teams in the NFL. Now, now here's the schedule that they have. So you come back from the bye week, and you have that Super Bowl rematch against the Chiefs. Then, oh, yeah, follow the following week, you got the Buffalo Bills, followed by the NFC Championship rematch against the 49ers. You face the Cowboys again in, in uh, Arlington. Then you go to Seattle. You're home against the Giants. Home against the Cardinals, and you finish against your season regular season against the Giants. If Kate, when you look at that stretch, what will you predict that uh, that eight games, the four home, four away? What do you think the re- their record will be when all said and done? 
It's tough. It's really tough because the Eagles are 8-1 and one for a reason. They're arguably the best team in the NFL right now. And by far, through nine weeks, the best team in the NFC. You look at the slate, though. Each, you know, at least four of these teams, I think you could argue, if things go right, you know, based off their talent, um, maybe at the end of the year they could hot could get hot and run go for a Super Bowl run. The Chiefs, the Bills, the Niners, and even the Cowboys after they lost last night. Like all of these teams are legit contenders, and you face them all in a row. And it's it's really tough, no matter you know how good you are, to be able to come away <clears throat> and win. You know. All of these games. And then the back end of the slate gets easier with Seattle. Uh, the Giants twice without Daniel Jones, who looks like he's out for the season with a torn ACL. And then the Cardinals, who will have Kyler Murray probably in that game. Yesterday, they threw out rookie Clayton Toon from Houston, and that didn't go well. But even with Kyler Murray, that team is pretty bad. But that four game slate is the one that, or five, if you want to include Seattle, who lost pretty bad to Baltimore yesterday. But in my opinion, are still a pretty good team. That five-game slate is really, really, really tough. I think – or that's tough, but in my opinion, they're going to come away 6-2, and two, I think, you know, down the stretch. The losses uh, – 6 and 2 I th- That's tough. Ooh. I, I, I just uh, – <laughs> well, let, me, let me break down, like, at least my thoughts on, like, the game. Uh, Chiefs-wise, I still think – they're a really good team. Obviously, they have Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, and that defense is really, really good and underrated. Not only do they have you know Chris Jones, one of the best defensive tackles in football, they got a really good group of linebackers. They have nice players on that defensive line around him. I get all of those things, and hey, they beat the Eagles in the Super Bowl last year. Um, they took they they picked them apart. I and mean, that was with Mahomes, who was hurt during that time with the banged up ankle. Going down to Arrowhead, it's a really loud environment, and that's going to be a tough game to win. But I was watching, you know, that Dolphins game yesterday, and yes, they found a way to win that game. And it's similar to the Eagles. The Eagles weren't perfect yesterday, and they found a way to win the game. That's what good teams or great teams do. But at the same time, this Kansas City team, to me, does not look, you know as explosive compared to last year, especially compared to two years ago when they had Tyreek Hill. They're very reliant on Travis Kelsey. I just don't see a lot of you know juice from this offense. The wide receiver core of Marcus Gettos, um, with and, and Justin Watson and uh, Rashi Rice and Sky Moore, I just don't see a lot of juice from that wide receiver core. And I get the Eagles have had a ton of secondary issues, but this is a game where maybe – um, it doesn't get as exposed as much, even with Patrick Mahomes being so great. I just, I just don't think this Kansas City team right now is the best team in the AFC. Uh, to me, the Ravens look like the best team, and there are a few other teams. I, if if you put them next to Kansas City, I don't think there's too much of a difference. Miami should have won that game yesterday. Uh, terrible sequence of plays down there, ending with a, a botch, you know, a snap from Connor Williams to two at the end of that game. But Miami should have won that game. They almost came back from 21 nothing. So the Chiefs team from last year, and I, I get they're not – in previous years, they haven't always looked like the best team in the middle of the year, and they, they get hot. But at this current state, I think the Eagles will win this game. I have, Right now, that's just just my gut feeling. And then the Bills, on the other hand, I is another one. I think they win for the fact that Buffalo had so many injuries on that defense this year. They're just not the same team currently. You lose Tredavious White. You lose Matt Milano. You add Razul Douglas, which helps the secretary. You don't have to play Kyrie Elam anymore, who looks like a bust so far. But you get Douglas you know, in there. Is that enough to fix you know, their issues, though? At times, you know, Josh Allen looks like the best quarterback in football, and he's been pretty good this year. But there are times also when he throws two or three interceptions. It hasn't happened a ton since that week one game. But He's not always consistent. This team isn't always consistent. So I think, you know, it's another game they could win. The forty, the two losses that will happen from just gut feeling and just the way how I think things are going to shape up, we're going to do two teams in the NFC. I, I see them losing 
to the Cowboys in AT&T Stadium. They've always struggled there. Uh, Dallas was pretty close last night, and they got matchups that they want. It works. C.D. Lamb, uh, Jake Ferguson, they match up really well with the Eagles. That defensive line is incredible. And right now, if, if I had to look too far in the future and thought about the playoffs, they match up better to me than the 49ers do with the Eagles. But at the same time, I think the Niners – is going to be the other loss because they're going to get healthy. And they've lost three games in a row, and I, and I get that. And th- there are some reasons to be concerned, but they're going to get healthy. Can't see them fully collapsing. So those are the two losses in the NFC. But the rest of the games, the Giants, I, without Daniel Jones, that's a sweep. The Cardinals, um, not a very good football team. And Seattle yesterday proved that they are I – mean, they're, they're still a good team, but they're not great. And I think the Eagles match up well against them. Yeah, six and two. That's I, I. I feel like I'm gonna say that's a bold move, Cotton. Let's see if this pays <laughs> off for that one. See, and, and I'm saying all this stuff and hype this up, but I actually have them going five and three in that stretch. But I have different different reasonings for that for how they're going to do that. I I think when you play the Chiefs at Arrowhead, even with all the hoopla and everything else, for it's a tough place to win. I still have the Eagles. I, I still have the Eagles as a loss on that one. Too. I had that one going into there. I see them. I see them really beating the uh, the Bills and the Niners. I, I truly do. I look at the Bills; they're not, they're not as strong as they were coming into it. It's, like, it's one of those things where you look at the schedule early. He's like, "Uh oh, this, this is going to be a tough matchup." But I look at the way that Josh Allen is playing; I still think there's just some issues there, and he's, he's a turnover machine. And and I think the Eagles can can limit that Buffalo Bills offense. I have them losing in the back to back games in Dallas, where they always had issues with playing in, in Jerry World, and you know, I think they lose again. You have to go back. To, to back to Philadelphia and then have to go back again cross country to play the Seattle Seahawks. And I think that's another, that's a tough ask for them to do. So that's the three there. And I think they went out the Giants and Cardinals. I almost have this being that this is almost four losses because I, if before the season, because had not, had they beaten the Jets, which I thought they still should have done it, I would have had them losing the Giants the last week of the season because they would have had all their backups in. And he was just like, all right, cool, let's see. What, what, what does Jalen Hurst look like when he's sitting on the sideline? What does such and such? It was one of those things. So, But I think they're going to need that game now with the Lions being as strong as they've shown in the easy schedule that is. I, I last week, I, I, I know – and, and people are going to say it, it would be surprised that if the Eagles might be that last uh, – that Sunday night flex game as the quote unquote uh, see who wins the one seed if they go against the Giants, which they should win that game, given that uh, Daniel Jones like he's out for the season and, and the Giants other issues going on. But I look at five and three, and I, even then I still think it's I think we there's still a very good outside there's still a good shot to win a one seed, but you need the Lions to lose at some point, and it's tough looking at their schedule. Maybe they lose one against the Vikings. They still have two against the Vikings. Maybe it was one, but. They need to uh, six and two. If they finish six and two, I think they guarantee that one spot. If they finish five and three, they're going to need to fight and call and need the lines lose somewhere or else. We're watching this team playing a wild card weekend as a two seed, I think, of that. But uh we're getting the home stretch. Caden, any final thoughts on your first show on on a no the first no huddle show? Yeah, it was great. Uh just you know, talking about the Eagles. I'm excited for everyone out there here who is listening continue to follow our content at nj.com and continue to watch this podcast grow but it was it's gonna be an interesting uh stretch like we just talked about after the bye week but at least there's a week off now for you know eagles fans out there you could you can take a break you can relax you can uh watch red zone this week and you don't have to uh, you know stress too much it's the one week of the year where it can just be Smooth sailing for everyone. So I think it's an overall good thing that everyone's going to get a little bit of a bye week in a sense. But it's, uh, it's going to be fun to see what happens when uh, we come back. Nice. Yeah, that way too. I really, I'm really curious to see uh, every year around this time when it gets a bye week, the Eagles do their self scout, the offensive coaches scout the defense, and vice versa. I really want to see what changes they make after this because it's some changes definitely need to be made and seeing that. But as for the for the first show, good job. Good job. Welcome aboard, rookie. He's uh, welcome aboard with this and uh, seeing this. But as you as you mentioned earlier, for everybody else out there, make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Also, make sure to continue to follow along for, throughout this bye week and the following week for heading up against that Super Bowl fifty seven, the uh, Super Bowl rematch against the Kansas City Chiefs by going to nj.com slash Eagles. So for Caden, I'm Chris. Everybody have a good one. See ya. <laughs>